Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the pastor at Cross of Life, and we're so thankful that you clicked on this video. We really pray that it benefits you, it grows your faith, or maybe introduces you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced before. But what we also want for you is to be connected to a local congregation. So if Cross of Life is your home congregation, we're glad that you make use of these resources, but make sure that this never comes in the place of coming together for worship with the body of believers. Let's be a church that values in-person gathering when so much of life is digital. And if you're somebody who's not from Mississauga, uh, get in touch with the local church in your area. It can be so easy to pick and choose, oh, I like this preacher or I like this message, but never actually invest in the place that Jesus says that he is, in his body, the church. And we encourage you to take time to put yourself into his body, in a local congregation, so that you can pray for one another, love one another, support one another, forgive one another, do all the things that the scripture talks about for one another. So we hope you're blessed by this video, and we hope that we get the chance to see you in person sometime soon. We're continuing our sermon series on the Ten Commandments called Echo. And we're calling this series Echo because uh, the series is on the six chief parts of Christian doctrine that we want to be constantly repeating, that we want to be saying again and again and again, not just because we need to hear them as the foundational truths of Christianity, but as we learned back at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, because these are things that need to be passed on from generation to generation. And so as our children learn from us, as we speak, we ought to be echoing, repeating the same truths that God gave to us and to our fathers and mothers before us. We're in the Ten Commandments with the Fourth Commandment. The text comes from Deuteronomy 5, verse 16, where God says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. This is God's word. So as I said, we've been working through the Ten Commandments, and uh, just as by way of review, let's go back and look at those first three commandments for a second. Uh, We we learned now three weeks ago that the first thing that God says in the first commandment is not actually love the Lord, excuse me, uh, uh, you shall have no other gods, but it is that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That the first thing that God says when he gives us the Ten Commandments is a statement of unconditional election and gospel. That you are his not because you are are pulling it off or because you're cleaning yourself up or because you're going to do a really good job following these Ten Commandments, but because God says unequivocally, you are mine, that's the end of it. It puts the whole of the Ten Commandments under this umbrella of the gospel, that it is not something I do in order to make God happy with me or to be a good Christian. I am actually already loved and and affirmed by God, and I am already a good Christian in the work of Jesus for me. Now, the Ten Commandments are sort of the house rules. They're the ways that life can can flourish as we live together here under our Father in heaven. Now, after God had made that statement, he does say that you shall have no other gods before me, which you could probably summarize this way. God is God, and you are not. God is the one who calls the shots. God is the one who is in control. God is the one who created you, formed you, redeemed you, supports you, and will ultimately take you to be with him. It is all about him. He's the protagonist of the story, and you are not. And that is at first humbling, of course, because many of us believe ourselves to be the main character, but it is also freeing because it means that none of this actually depends on us. And so we put God above all other things because God is our redeemer and sustainer. God then told us to not misuse his name, to take it up in vain, which we said is to speak the truth about God. Who God is, what God does, we say that according to the scripture, and we call out those who would not speak according to the scripture. We make sure the truth is held onto because God's name is important. It's a salvation matter. As Peter says, salvation is found in no other name. And then we found out last week that we are to make the Sabbath day holy, which means to make God's word a priority. Not just every Sunday to be here, but to make every day of our life filled with God's word, to rest in the gospel that knows us to the bottom and loves us to the skies. And that word would be something that we find together in community, not again just here, but in our families and in our life groups. And so now we get to the fourth commandment. Um, But something is is happening here as we shift into the fourth commandment. There is a, a flipping of the focus of the Ten Commandments. See, commandments one through three were all about our relationship with God. Right? Have no other gods. Use God's name properly. Remember the Sabbath day, which is about God's word. 
But commandments 4 through 10 no longer focus on our relationship with God, but instead focus on our relationship with our neighbor, with other people. Right? How do we honor authority? How do we take care of the bodies that God has given us? How do we manage the family? How do we manage possessions, our name, and the things that we do and do not have? Commandments 4 through 10 shift the focus from God to our neighbor. Jesus says this very clearly in the Gospels a couple times when he says, the greatest commandment is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Commandments 1 through 3. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. God's simply summarizing these Ten Commandments in those two teachings, those two tables of the law. And so now for the rest of this series, we're going to focus on our relationships together. How does life flourish together in community? But I think we have a couple challenges as we move into this second table of the law. And they have to do with both the loving part of loving your neighbor and the neighbor part of loving your neighbor. First of all, I think we have a trouble with the loving part of our neighbor. Excuse me, loving part of loving our neighbor. Because when people think about what it means to be a Christian or be in a Christian church, uh, very often they fall into one of two categories, neither of which are the love for the neighbor that God wants. On the one hand, uh, people fall into this trap of thinking that what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a good church-going Christian is to be about religious activity. To make sure you're going to church a lot, make sure you're opening your Bible a lot, make sure you're praying a lot. And it's not that those things are bad. In fact, that's exactly what God commands us to do in the first three commandments. But they are not what God ultimately wants from his church. I remember this summer we studied the book of Galatians. That's what the Galatians ran into. The false teachers in Galatia were saying to them, you know what you guys need to do in order to be good Christians? You need to do this extra religious activity. You need to follow the Old Testament codes. It's not that Jesus isn't important, not that Jesus hasn't done anything for you, but you need this extra stuff. Very often we fall into that. What makes me a good Christian? Well, I give my offerings and I'm there on time for church and I make the Lord's Supper a priority and I pray before my meals. And again, it's not that those things are bad, but it's that God recreated us in order to build the humanity that he, that he had originally created in the garden. A community of people who loved and honored and served one another. And it's not, again, that we don't want to love God, but that, that love ultimately flows from us to our neighbor. As one great theologian said, if God doesn't need our good works, he's doing just fine. But everyone else needs our good works. But the other ditch that people can fall into is to obsess about the good works that they do for their neighbor because they think that is the mechanism by which they make themselves right with God. Maybe they wouldn't say that I need to do these good works in order that I can be a Christian, but they would say, I need to do these good works in order to show that I'm a good Christian or to prove to myself or to prove to others that I'm a good Christian. This is also false. Remember God said, I am the Lord your God. You are a good Christian because I say you are. Your love for your neighbor is not a mechanism, a lever to pull in order to get up to me. It is the outflowing of that status that I have given you. So what Christians ultimately understand, if they understand the gospel, is that my Christian life is to be lived in love toward my neighbor, but not because I think that that's going to earn something for me, but because I know everything has already been earned for me. And so as we think about the loving our neighbor that the next seven commandments are going to give us, we have to have that attitude. This has to be a focus of our life. It can't just be that our Christianity is lived out in these four walls doing religious activity, although that's important. And it can't be that we go out into the world using other people as mechanisms in order to earn love with God. We must freely love them as those who have been chosen by God to be his church. So we have a problem with the loving, but I think we also have a problem with the neighbor. And it gets for a couple reasons. First of all, in English, neighbor is a, is a technical term. It means a specific person, namely the people who live in the housing units around you. Um, that may have been helpful a generation ago when none of us had vehicles that could travel quickly or over long distances, when we actually did have to live and work and play in our neighborhoods. But now you can go grocery shop five kilometers one way, and go get your clothes at the premium outlets down at Trafalgar, and you go on a day trip to Niagara, and you can spend some time at the lake, and you go see your family up in Barrie, and you can do this. And it's not that that's wrong, but it it skews our idea of what a neighbor is. 
When God says love our neighbor, we might think of the people who are living in the neighborhood that we live in, but God really means the people who are near to you. I mean, just to give you an example of this, none of you, with the exception of maybe Joanne, who lives closest to me, is my neighbor in a technical sense, right? Even Joanne lives a little far enough away that I, we probably are not exactly neighbors. But I would consider all of you more neighbors than the people who live in my neighborhood in many cases. Because I see you guys at least once a week, many times, multiple times a week. I'm around you, I'm near you, our relationships are there in ways that I don't have relationships with the people in my neighborhood. So we have to refocus our idea of what neighbor means. It doesn't just mean the people who live by me, it means the people who are near to me. But then I think we need to go even a step farther. Because the fourth, fifth, and sixth commandments, so these next three they're going to study, focus our hearts even more narrowly than just the concept of people who are near us. You can see it if you look at the three of them together. The fourth and the fifth commandment, excuse me, fourth and sixth commandments, are about family. Right, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. And the sixth commandment, do not commit adultery, which is the breaking of marriage. It's about the family of origin, the family that you came from, and the family that you are in right now. And in the middle of those two is the fifth commandment, the commandment about your body, protecting the body. In other words, what God is saying is you are a physical creature who comes from someplace and is going to someplace, and all those three things fit together. And so what God wants us to think about, at least primarily, as we think about loving our neighbor, are our family. It's not that he doesn't want us to think about other people. I mean, Paul says this in Galatians. You, you love first your family, then your church, then your larger community. But he does focus first on the family. He says the primary neighbor that you are to love in all of these commandments is your family. So our love has to be for those people who maybe even live in the same house with us. Now, this is really important because social scientists, demographers, they will say the family is the foundation of society, right? Solid families equal solid communities equal solid nations. And so God knows this too. I mean, he created humanity. He says in his first commandment about how we are to love each other that we are supposed to build solid families. But if you've ever been in a family, you know that that's really hard. Family is hard. And there are a number of reasons for why it's hard, but I'll give you three, and they're going to be an alliteration, and don't worry, I'm going to hit this one out of the park. Uh, three reasons that I think we struggle to love the people who maybe live within the four walls that we live in. The first is familiarity. Um, many of us could repeat the phrase, familiarity breeds contempt. We've all heard that. But have we ever stopped to think that the root of familiarity is family? <laughs> That we could actually probably retranslate that, that axiom and say being in a family breeds contempt. Why? Well, like I said to the kids, we're all kind of self-focused by nature. Like we're more concerned about what we want, what we want to do, how we're going to get there. Other people tend to get in the way because they don't think the same as we do. They don't talk the same as we do. They don't have the same priorities as we do. Even if those things line up in a lot of ways, they never line up absolutely perfectly. And it might be okay if it's a passing comment or one interaction, but when you're with a person all the time, or at least some time of every day, and those differences start to interact with one another, contempt can come out of them. Why aren't you like me? Why don't you think like I do? Why don't you talk like I do? Why don't you value what I value? It can be big things like how she handles an argument, or small things like how he chews his food, but like, those things, if given enough time, will breed contempt. And that's what we get in family. Secondly, flaws, which are different than familiarity. Familiarity might just be personality quirks or tics, but flaws are actually things that are, are wrong or sinful, things that are broken and corrupted about us, and in family, those things mess us up. Because Satan loves to keep score. Satan loves to look at the things that other people do and help you make tally marks how much you're better, or you wouldn't do that, or you have to hold that against them for the next time. It might be easy, again, in a passing conversation or a friendship to sort of ignore some of these things, but when you have to face that person every single day, you have interaction upon interaction. Those flaws start to pile up until it's really hard to love one another. And some of you know this. 
You know that there are things about your spouse or your kids or your parents or your brothers and sisters that aren't just like annoying, they're bad. And it bothers you. And it can be hard to genuinely love them when you know those things are happening. The third then is feelings. Feelings. Some of you have really hard jobs. You tell me about this, how you you have jobs where you have to tell people bad news. And I think for most of you, of course, you you feel that to some extent, but eventually you go home and you put it out of your mind and you move on with your life. Like when you give somebody bad news, you're fired, your debt is defaulted, you can't pay whatever it is. Like that hurts for a little minute, but then you, you move on. But what happens when the feelings are hurt? And instead of both going to your own separate homes, you go back to the same home. What happens when when she says something that she can't take back, when he says something that cuts deeper than, than you'd like? When some mistake is made that you can't go back from, and you don't just get to go back to your own separate homes, you, you have to live together. Those feelings, they build up over time, and it can make it hard to love family. Some of you know this. There are things in your family that you don't talk about. Everybody knows it, but you don't talk about it because the feelings are too strong. You know the voices would get raised. You know the tears would come. You know the doors would slam. Whatever it is, it's hard to love family. But that's what what God calls us to do. He calls us to see that though we were, by nature, God's uh, creation, in his image, his sons and daughters, and we threw that away, He was willing to give up his own life to bring us back into family. And while there are so many applications that we can talk about in society, we want to start here, because this is where God wants us to start, with love for our our primary neighbor, our our family members. So uh, maybe that'll help us as we think about the next seven commandments, because I think it would be easy for me to go down all the different rabbit trails of what the Ten Commandments talk about. We could talk about abortion and unjust government and transgenderism and all these other things that would fit under the Ten Commandments, but we're not going to talk about them here. If you do want to talk about them, I have a Bible study on Tuesday about marriage, sex, and family, uh, marriage, sex, and singleness, and then on Saturday, we're doing Growing in Grace and Knowledge, which is where we take the Ten Commandments and we break them down into even further applications. If you want to talk about that stuff, those are the places to do it. But for today, I want to just get us to a very foundational level on the Fourth Commandment. I want to get us to the, just the basic principle behind it, because I think we engage those more difficult conversations without actually having the foundation of what God is holding on to in his Ten Commandments first. So, to start us down the path, let me ask you a super pedantic question that eventually you'll realize is not all that pedantic. Did God make you unique? I don't know about uh, those of you who are a little bit older than me, but if you're about my age or younger, you have been told from early on that you are special and you are unique. And the Bible would agree, right? God knit you together in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made you are. You are very unique. Here's maybe a less pedantic question. Why? Why did God make you unique? I mean, there are some very unique things about us as humanity together. I think maybe the most obvious is that some of us are male and some of us are female. Like God, when he created human beings, he could have created the ideal human with all of the characteristics that are wonderful about women and all the characteristics that are wonderful about men jam-packed into one being. He could have done that, but he didn't. He separated, in a sense, his image into male and female. Some characteristics of him that are embodied in femininity, and some characteristics of him that are embodied in masculinity. Why did God make us unique? Why did God make some of us men and some of us women? And maybe secondly, as I was talking to the kids about, why did God make us to age? I mean, he made it Adam and Eve as adults. He could have made us adults. We would have just appeared, I don't know, out of the forest or something as adults. But he chose to have every one of us who's in this room start as a helpless, useless little baby. And on the other end, he let us die the way that we die. He could have just said at some point, kind of like Enoch or Elijah, like, I'm just taking you to heaven now. But he lets us suffer. He lets us deteriorate. Deteriorate. 
He lets our minds forget things, not be able to solve problems, arthritis take over our joints, cancer take over our bodies. Why does he let that happen? Why does God make us unique? I think the answer has something to do with silverware. Forks are really great things. They can do a lot of stuff. They're primarily good at poking and then picking something up. But you know what they're really bad at? Soup. Uh, if you ever tried to eat soup with a fork, you probably had some sideways looks, because it doesn't work. You need a spoon in order to scoop up soup. And have you ever tried to cut like a, a thick steak with a fork? You might be able to cut through your green beans, or maybe get a, a scoop out of the mashed potatoes with your fork, but to cut through something that, that really is thick, you need a knife. We have different utensils to do different jobs as we enjoy the beauty of what God has given us in food. And God has done the same with humanity. Instead of making us all the same, he has made us all unique. So that, together, we create something beautiful. But maybe to press this back to something a little bit more theological, this is the way God is. Right? God reveals himself to us as a trinity. Three individual persons distinct from one another in one God. He could have been just one God, but then he wouldn't have been able to love. In eternity past, before creation existed, he was only one God, like Muslims or Jews believe. He would not have been capable of love because there would have been no one to love and no one to love him. And so, necessarily, creation must have come not out of love, but out of a desire for control and power. But that's not who God is. God is multiple, and he is united, which means he was capable in love of love. In fact, he is love, and so he created you and I, unique from each other, out of love, in order to teach us to love one another. And God came into the world as a baby. God could have come into the world as an adult, but he chose at Christmas to come through the womb of Mary, just like any of us were born. And the Bible tells us that he grew, not just physically, but in his knowledge and in his wisdom. God could have come into the world as a perfectly packaged product, but he chose to be under authority, to be unique from his mother and father who trained him and loved him and helped him grow up until he could take the authority that was given to him by his father in heaven over all of us through his death and resurrection. God make it, made us unique. Why? So that we can, well, live together. Now, the Lutheran theologians call this vocation, the unique things that God has called you to be and to do that no one else has the same combination of. You are only the husband to your wife. You are only the wife to your husband. You are only the parent to your children. No one else has that vocation. But you have many other things. You work at certain jobs, you live in certain communities, you go to certain places, et cetera, et cetera. God made us this way because he is this way. So here's the really challenging question. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with the fact that God made you unique? We might all answer, yes, of course, I'm, I'm glad that God made me unique, uh, until we hear something like, wives, submit to your husbands. Or only men are called to be pastors in God's church. Or children need to be disciplined with a rod of authority by their parents. Or we have to submit to a government even when they are mistreating us. Suddenly, authority doesn't sit as well with us when we start to apply it. We like the concept that God created us unique, but we don't like how that manifests itself in daily life. The problem, of course, is sin. Sin corrupts marriage and corrupts parenting and corrupts societies and corrupts churches. But it's not that the, the ideal is not what God wants. And so what every one of us has to wrestle with is, am I okay that God designed me the way that he designed me? Am I okay that I was born in the year I was born? That I'm a man or a woman? Am I okay that I'm married to the person I'm married to? or I'm in the church where that guy's the pastor, or I'm in the country where that guy's the prime minister. Like, am I okay with the fact that God made me in this specific place, in this specific way, right now? 
And only you can answer that. But I'll give you a little help. Remember that Jesus was willing to put himself in an uncomfortable place for the sake of your flourishing. He could have been ruler over all things for all time and just damned all of us to hell because we all messed up his creation. But instead, he chose to make himself uncomfortable, as the book of Philippians says, taking on the very nature of a servant. Or as Jesus himself said in Matthew 20, he came to serve and not to be served. Are we okay with that? Probably not. But when we think about Jesus, it gets a little bit easier. So here's a big principle, if you're taking notes with us. We have to believe that each of us is designed by God to uniquely serve our neighbors. You might not like the way that God has made you, but he did it on purpose. You may not like the applications that you hear in the scripture, but God gives you those on purpose so that you can uniquely love your neighbor. Which gets us to the principle behind the fourth commandment. That those unique things about you put you into a relationship with every, other sing- every single other person that fits into this category, authority and submission. Every other person that you interact with, even if it's only for a moment, you kind of get into this authority and submission uh, interaction. Now, submission is a hard word for us because we immediately think of like taking an arm bar in a cage match when we hear submission. That's not really what God is pushing at. So I'll give you a number of other ways that you can think about this. Um, This is the relationship that God puts every single one of us in our uniqueness into. You could call it teacher and student, sensei and deshe, master and apprentice, mentor and mentee, expert and novice, whatever you like, whatever makes you feel comfortable. But they're all the same thing. They're all authority and submission. And that is what God is giving us in the fourth commandment. Now the Bible defines this authority for us and what it's for. On the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, uh, this is why I write these things, he's given them a whole bunch of commands, when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, which is the authority that the Lord gave me for your building up, not for tearing you down. So he admits, authority sometimes has to be harsh. But the ultimate purpose of authority is for building someone up rather than tearing them down. Ultimately, any tearing down that happens is for the purpose of ultimately uh, building up. And you heard Jesus talk about it in Matthew 20, right? He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They take their authority and they use it for their own good. They exercise that authority over them, but not so with you, he says. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He says, authority is both earned and enacted in servanthood. That person who has authority is not to use that authority in order to get things for themselves, but to use that authority in order to serve those under their authority, in order to build them up. To summarize that, if you're taking notes with us, authority is given to one for the sake of those who are under the authority. The authority is given to one for the sake of those who are under the authority. Now, I know this has been thick and a lot of me talking, so let me just put a cute picture of a baby up on the screen for you. This is my son, Clayton. Um, I have authority over him. And it's not for my good. Or like, his life in my house makes my life harder. I mean, he's a great baby. I love him dearly, but he does. He makes life a little bit more challenging for me and my family. I have authority over him. I suppose I could use that authority, authority to make him less of a problem in my life. I could lock him in a room and let him cry himself to sleep, or I could do any number of things to get rid of the difficulty of having a child, but my authority over him is given for his sake, so that he would grow up to be a functioning member of society. This is the picture that God gives us in himself. Right? He comes to us as father and son, along with the Holy Spirit. It's not because one person of the Trinity had a baby, But that the the relationship that the Father and the Son have is this picture of one using his authority for the sake of the one under his authority. Now, the Bible says that there are three places where God forces authority on us. It might be in a common conversation, for example, if I'm talking to one of you and you know something about a topic that I don't know. I might ask you about what you think or what your opinion is on a thing, and you would be, we even say it this way, the authority on that. And I might listen to you because I trust you and you're an expert. 
but I don't have to. But there are three places where God says we do have to submit to authority. Those three places are, first, the family. That's what we've been talking about. God says that the father of the house is given the authority over his family for the sake of his family. And that the, the parents together, with the wife under the authority of her husband, have authority over their children for the flourishing of their children. Second, the church. God gives pastors and leaders to a church to be the authorities over the church. To say what is important, what has to be done, what the truth is, for the sake of the church. And finally, the state or the government. That God puts rulers into authority in our states and our governments so that they would be beneficial to those under the authority. And God commands us to submit to these authorities. And of course, to use the authority if we have it in each of these institutions well. And right now, I'm sure some of you are hoping that I would go into these three and give you all sorts of applications about how to do these things. What do we do when we have a, a, an absentee father or a, an abusive husband, or if we have a, a pastor who is taking advantage of his flock or, or a government who is unjust? What do we do in those situations? Go to Bible study on Tuesday or Saturday and I'll answer all those questions. But I'm just gonna give you the truth. This is what God says. So then let me give you three ways to start thinking about this, because we're getting short on time. Three principles for how to submit to authority in those three estates, those three institutions. The first is to look at the source, the source of that authority. A book of Romans 13 gives us some really interesting teaching on what it means to submit, particularly to governmental authorities. But there's, there's a really cool principle that shows up four times in these two verses from Romans 13, which makes me think God thinks this is important. Paul writes, by God's inspiration, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, for the one who is an authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear a sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. God's authority is what gets given to human authorities. Like all human authority ultimately derives its authority from God. And two things to think about that. First of all, that means you have to submit to it. Even if you don't like the person. You might not like who your prime minister is, or your premier is, or your pastor is, or your father or husband, but you gotta submit. You have to take that authority and see it as God's authority ultimately. Even if you don't like that person. And... Remember that God's the one who gave them authority. That if they're unjustly using it, if they're using it to abuse you or others, God is not going to take that lightly. Do you remember what Jesus said about people who take their authority and use it to abuse those under authority? It would be better for them if they had a millstone tied around their neck and that they were thrown into the heart of the sea. You think God doesn't care? You think God won't notice? I mean, frankly... If you had a babysitter come over and watch your kids, and that babysitter was abusing your children, do you think you wouldn't do something about it? This is what God does. And while we may not see it in this moment, we have to understand that is what God's authority given to authority figures means. Second, the exception. The exception. We get this from Acts 5, where Peter and the other apostles say, we must obey God rather than human beings. The Bible says that if you have an authority figure who is using his authority to lead you away from God, to do something that God explicitly commands not to do, then you must disobey. Not you can disobey, no, you must disobey. And again, you might be asking, well, can we have a number of applications about that? And I can't, I don't have the time for it today. But we have to see that in our authority relationships. If a father or a husband or a pastor or a leader of a governmental authority is leading us away from God or commanding us to do something that God explicitly tells us not to do, we must disobey them. And then finally, the ideal. The ideal. I think the only way to get this to work in our minds is to realize who God is and what it means that God both had authority and submitted to authority. And we sing in one of our songs that, um, that bowing to the Father's will, Jesus took a crown of thorns. 
It was God the Father's will that Jesus would die on the cross. He had the authority. He used it for those under his authority. And Jesus did it with joy. It's not because Jesus was less glorious or less powerful or less worthy of worship or less lovable. Like the, like the Trinity had a, mo- a meeting and like the Holy Spirit and the Father had a coup against Jesus and were like, well, somebody's got to die and we're teaming up on you. Like that's not how it happened. Jesus, in fact, in many ways is more worshiped and more glorious because of what he did for you. Because he submitted. And the Father used his authority in order to bless those under his authority. So let's not think for a second that being in authority is anything less than trying to serve like God. And let us not think that being under authority is anything less than to do what Jesus did. And only there will we find the joy of God's gift of authority. So again, we could go way deeper on this. But let's finish with Jesus. That seems like a good idea. That text we read earlier, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but it's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must become your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God, though he had all the authority, gave it up for you so that those of you who are in authority can use it to serve, and those who are under authority can use it to submit. I know there's a thousand things you want to think about and a thousand things you want to ask, and please do. Ask me, ask your brothers and sisters, think about, talk about, invest in these things so that they can become real in your life. But for now, let's pray. Jesus, there is so much we we want to think about, so many things that come up in our minds as we think about your gift of authority draw our minds back to the cross, where you, by your authority, sent your son to die for us, and he, by his willful submission, took our sin to set us free. I pray for those in authority, that they would use their authority not to lord it over others or to exercise authority for their own advantage, but to serve, to build others up with their authority, and that those under authority would submit willingly Even in the cases where authority is not being used well, give them the patience and the courage to do what is right, even though it feels hard. We ask that in your name. Amen.